G. Worthington Hippo is one of America's most dynamic salesmen and sales managers. Throughout his career, he has been associated with major industries in various sales capacities, especially in the pioneering of new products. In recent years, he has been both Eastern sales manager and merchandising manager for the famous Fetters Corporation. And today, he has a solid reputation as a sales executive, author, and lecturer. Worth Hippo has seen the inertia and apathy among dealers and salesmen to educate their public and sell established items, as well as the radical innovations and new products coming on the market every day. He has talked to merchants who refuse to stock what turned out to be tomorrow's most sought after piece of merchandise. He has learned through years of experience how badly this country needs a new sales philosophy. And on this record, he shows you what such a philosophy can do. If you want the public to get excited about your product, he says, you must first get excited about it yourself. Everyone who talks to prospects in stores, homes, or offices must generate enthusiasm, expose their wares, and realize the tremendous importance of the advertising and sales promotion behind their product line. If you put these simple truths into practice, approaching each prospect with enthusiasm, a desire to educate him about what you have to sell, and with the knowledge to transmit that enthusiasm and desire to him, you can truly sell yourself rich. At this time, the Businessmen's Record Club is proud to introduce you to a talk by the same title, Sell Yourself Rich, given by Mr. Hippel to a group of sales executives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Here is G. Worthington Hippel. They tell the story about the young man that used to go up to the Concord in the Catskills every weekend. And every weekend that he drove up there, he got pinched for speeding. He got pinched going up, and he got pinched coming back twice a week. This went on week in and week out. And finally, the fellow got to know the cop pretty well. There was a kind of a spree de corps between them. The cop's name was McGarity. McGarity gave him the tickets. He took the tickets, and everything seemed to work out all right. After some time had gone by, this young fellow was notified that he had inherited a fantastic amount of money. Because someplace along the line, he must have had a traumatic experience. The first thing the kid thought about was Officer McGarity. And as soon as he got the money, as soon as he got the money, he went down and he bought himself a 300 SL Mercedes Benz. If you ladies don't know, this car will do 160 miles an hour on the flat. And he started out for the Concord Hotel. He stopped first to get a cap. You understand you can't drive in one of those cars without a cap. And he was going along 70 miles an hour through a 30 mile zone looking for McGarity. And pretty soon, McGarity saw him and went out after him. And McGarity's right behind him, going about 70, yelling, pull over. And with this, the kid pushes it to the floor, goes about 85, 90 miles an hour, and pulls away. He lets up on the gas. He starts to slow down. And he keeps slowing down until McGarity catches up again. McGarity is fuming now, ready to pull his pistol. And he yells, pull over. They're going 85. With this, the kid goes all the way to the floor. And he's gone 150 miles an hour. He starts to slow down, and he keeps slowing down looking for McGarity. He keeps slowing down until he's almost come to a stop. So he turns around, and he drives back about three miles, and there's McGarity up against a tree, uniform torn to pieces, blood all over him, motorcycle smashed to pieces. The kid's fundamentally a nice kid. He jumps out of the car with anguish on his face, he runs over to the cop, he says, McGarity, what happened? And the Irishman looked up to him and he says, the last time he says you pulled away, he says, I thought me motorcycle stopped and I got off. <laughs> the 
Let me tell you why I told you that story. I told you that story because in my 50 years, I learned one thing well. Fundamentally, most of us are pretty much alike. You know, when I tell that joke in Boston, they don't laugh any more or any less than they do in Toledo, Ohio. And last night, I talked at a suburb of Fort Lauderdale in Miami, and they <laughs> didn't laugh any more last night. There were only eight or 900 people instead of a crowd like this. Because you see, it's really true. If you will stick a person, God forbid, in the behind with a pin in Fort Lauderdale, he'll jump just about as far as they do in Eden, Oklahoma. So tonight, let's do one thing. Let's not hide behind that old Dorothea Brand alibi. We're different. You will get the same story that I tell every place I go. We won't change it for Fort Lauderdale. Oh, granted, everybody grabs me by the shoulder just when I'm ready to go and say, Mr. Hill, I don't want to tell you how to talk or anything like that. But you know, the people down here are different. Well, what's different about them? They got a cleft head, I say, they walk on the left side of the street. They aren't. They love, they laugh, and they cry like every place else. You take my word for it. Now, one of the first things I want to talk to you about, I want to show you something, because I do this only because it sticks in your mind better. I wanted to show you something here, if you would. This is a bottle, and I, I'm just gonna quickly preface this remarks. Please, I am not concerned about plugging anybody. I have picked these things for a specific reason. This is a bottle of ice cold Coca-Cola. It has six ounces of Coca-Cola in it, and it's an amazing thing only because, well, see, Coca-Cola, the little bottle sells for five cents. A buck at the Fountain Blue, <laughs> or at the pump room in Chicago. Five cents, ice cold Coca-Cola. You know something rather interesting about it is, this bottle here that I'm holding in my hand now is the same as the first bottle I picked up. And there's another bottle here, and that bottle is the same, and you know, I know it's hard to believe, they all have the same cap on them. And they put the same lot of Coca-Cola in each bottle. And it's amazing. But when they advertise Coca-Cola, they never say anything different for Fort Lauderdale. They say the same thing they're saying in New York and Boston and Cleveland. Drink ice cold Coca-Cola, the positive pressure. See, that's a funny thing I know to you, but that's what they do always tell the same thing. This here, Ajax, that foaming cleanser, chases the dirt right down the drain. Ajax, amazing. They have a little piece of paper on the top. Now, you men wouldn't know this because you're out making a buck and she has, but you just tear that little piece of paper off that. You don't have to punch the holes anymore. Saves a lot of time. I personally checked and found out that this can of Ajax in my left hand has the same amount of holes in the top as the one here. And they both sell for the same price. That's a fact. And they both have red letters Ajax, and this third can, that's the same. And if you waltzed in 10,000 cases of Ajax, they'd all look the same, all sell for the same price, all have the same amount of holes in them. I know, it's hard to believe. Go along with me, because sometimes I get hysterical. Tide, tides in, dirt's out. Tides in, dirt's out. This box of Tide says it's a wash day miracle, and darn if they didn't print the same thing on this one. And they have the same amount of Tide in each one of those boxes. Did I hear some older person like me say, what happened to the gold dust twin? Oh, please, for you young people, it was on the back cover of every Saturday evening post through the first 15 to 18 years of my life. And then they stopped telling people about it. They're dead as a mackerel now. You can stop telling them any time you want. And the day you stop telling them about the product you sell or you represent, Cut your neck from here to here. You are through. The only thing that really fascinates me about these products, there could be a million products here, is that one company sells infinitely more cans of Ajax or more Coca-Colas or more Tide or more watches or more whatever you want to pick out. Why? You see, I am just nutty enough to believe that the difference, the split difference, between success and failure is advertising and merchandising. And then you say to yourself, you satiated salesmen, you men that have spent your life being salesmen, how big a jerk does this guy think we are? Because my dear Mr. Hipple, price makes the difference. Really? You mean price is the determining factor in why people buy? It's a good thing I came to Fort Lauderdale. 
because only 4% of the people, for your information, in the United States buy price. 96% of the people, we sell price. How do we do it? We get them right on the floor with our foot on their throat and say, look, I got this for $189.95. I don't want to trade you up, just buy this. This is the thing I advertise for you. We sell them price every day of our life. Ooh, if I could just get some scabby price that I could run in the newspaper to get the fish to come in. Just give me a price. Do me a favor, will you? The next time you buy an automobile, wire me at Hunter Mill Farm in Oakland, Virginia. Collect, tell me how it worked out, will you? Go out and buy an automobile and walk into the automobile company and grab the automobile, make him get up out of the chair. <laughs> And when you get him in front of you, say, Mr. Automobile Dealer, I would like to buy an automobile. Hold him so he doesn't sink to the floor and say, I'll tell you what I want. I want a black, either Ford, Chevy, Plymouth, Chrysler, you name it. I want a black Ford or Chevy or Plymouth. And I want just four rubber tires on it. And I want a straight stick. You understand that, Mr. Dealer? Yep. Beginning to hate you now, but that's what I want. And Mr. Dealer, I'll tell you what I want. I don't want white wall tires. I don't want power steering. I don't want power brakes. I don't want a two, a two window shield washer bag so you can squirt water on my windshield. And I don't want a two-tone car. And I don't want a radio. And I don't want a heater. I want price, don't you understand? You'll save $1,500 that you pay taxes on if you can get your fat mouth open and ask them for the price. Why don't you do it? Are any of you driving strip cars? No, my friend. We got as much on it as we could. <laughs> you bet, and we'll always do that. You don't know it today. They can't buy it fast enough. I have talked to almost every type, whether they sell watches, no matter, everybody wants to buy the best. Remember that. Don't use that old lead about price anymore. It won't work. Sure, they'll buy price if they can't get you to talk about anything else. And so that's why I showed you that. And also keep in your mind real fast that insurance companies charge about the same for $1,000 worth of life insurance. And you can't go to one and say, look, when you give me a dollar off, I take yours. Same price. You know what's an amazing thing? There are men in the insurance business that belong to the half a million dollar club. The men that belong to the million dollar club. The men that belong to quarter million dollar sales a year. But they all got the same price. Isn't that funny? I wonder why. Okay, I tell you, you don't believe me. You get your policy out and the one that yours is printed on, same kind of paper. Everything's the same. So don't use that. Now, to pacify me so I don't become a violent, accept what I said. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about the fact that I told you that it is my considered opinion that one of the most powerful medium in the world for moving people is advertising. There is nothing quite like it. It will do more. It, it moves them. Oh, it is legion what it will do. You can do almost anything you want with the consuming public, with advertising. Newspaper advertising, radio, television, magazines, advertise, direct mail, day in, day advertise, you move the world. Believe me, don't you? Sure you do. Look. You, people like me, get up every morning. We're bitter about it, but we do get up. And we stagger into the bathroom and wash what we have left up there of our teeth with our nationally advertised toothpaste and with our nationally advertised toothbrush. And then we wash our face with our nationally advertised soap and shave with our nationally advertised shaving cream and our nationally advertised razor, even if we don't play baseball. <laughs> and then we put our nationally advertised stuff on the hair. You know, not two dabs, just one. A little dab will do you. <laughs> and then when we get through doing that, we obviously have to use a deodorant because they explain, you stink too, mister. <laughs> and then we wander downstairs to smoke our nationally advertised cigarette while we're shaking and saying, where is our nationally advertised coffee with the 43 beans? <laughs> I give you my solemn word, 
A dentist told me, he said, Mr. Hippel, I want to tell you, the truth of the matter is, you could wash your teeth better with salt. Now the question is, have you got the guts to tell your friends you're using salt? <laughs> Hexa, hexa, hexachlorophene. They look in your medicine closet. You would be ruined. I know I always look in theirs. When they lock the door, I know they're looking in mine. Late that night, she says, what'd you think of the party? She says, I looked in their medicine closet. I think Herbert's got heart trouble. Got some pills in there. No, no, we must use nationally advertised products. Well, it works. You take my word for it. It works extremely well. Uh, during the war, Lucky Strike Green went to war, you know, and then uh, they brought out a white Lucky Strike cigarette. And everything was going along fine, and all of a sudden they ran an ad with a guy with a crew haircut that had a face like granite. And he had his fist up like that, and he had a tattoo on it that said, you got a lot to like with a marble. Filter, flavor, flip top box. Well, it took a lot of guts to pull a pack of cigarettes out of your pocket if they weren't in a flip top box. Everybody had to have a flip top box. Now the others didn't want to copy, so it said it was a crush proof, crush proof box. They got a crush proof box. And this went on and on and on. Now they've had their fun with you. They've had their fun with you. One day the guy put his hand up and he said, what is that? A growth? Oh, oh, it's the cigarettes. Yeah. Well, now, they didn't want to hurt you, and they've taken our little beetle brains and mashed them the other way now, and they said, it's time, let's change it. Now they've given you back what you had originally. Spending millions to tell you about it, too. Crush proof. Soft pack. Let's give them the soft pack now. See, pretty soon they'll get you off the filters. They'll get you back to just plain, raw cigarettes. Believe me, you can... Hey, I give you my solemn word. I give you my word. If you will advertise water buffalo ears enough, put them in a cellophane bag, some chump will walk in and say, I'll take a package of those water buffalo ears. <laughs> what he will do with them, I haven't the slightest idea, but he'll buy them because he can't help it. He walks in like a magnet drawn to this advertising. Every one of us, like tonight, here you are. At least it's cool in here, but you could be home watching the idiot box. <laughs> Learning about the commercial. I like dial. I mean, you could be home there getting educated so you could go out tomorrow to buy something else. Well. <laughs> because this works, and it works so well, if you are one of these people who say, I don't believe in advertising, I actually have had people say to me, oh, advertising doesn't work for me. For years, I used to carry a Coke bottle with me because I always wanted to shove it down his throat the hard way, <laughs> not this way. You see, it does work. Everybody around the country that I know, giants of their successes today, took their last buck. I know a guy that's a millionaire today, spent his last $800 on a full page ad in the newspaper, tell the people what he got. You keep it a secret, you, nobody will bother you, see? Tell them about it and keep telling them. So that you can get home and at least make the Late Late Show tonight, will you accept what I've told you? Advertising is fantastic. It will do the job. God, you know it. But I want you to remember you've got to take it in your arms and really love it. Don't fight it. The more you do, the more money you'll make. It has never failed anybody. You can't even do bad advertising as long as you keep your name in front of the consuming public on enough time because familiarity disarms opposition. When they hear your name enough times, you could be a burglar. They say, let him in. <laughs> now that you have heard from Worth Hipple on the tremendous power of advertising, let's turn this record to side two to learn what this advertising can do for you, the salesman. It works. Because it does work on any given day you want to pick, a live one walks into the store. Now something happens 
that no living man since the beginning of time has been able to overcome or even describe. This customer who has been driven in by the force of millions and millions of dollars worth of all kinds of advertising now finds themselves face to face with a phenomena nobody can explain. If you put your hands on him, he's warm. He's in a vertical position. They call him a salesman. What this man can do in a split second is beyond belief. He can blow a million dollar advertising campaign faster than anybody else in the world. <laughs> he is a symphony at this. You'd think he went into training. But brother, he is marvelous. Marvelous, and if you ask him how he got or why the customer left, he's safe. He's safe because one word was put in the, the English language that saves him. That word is shopper. Why'd she go? Shopper. And you see where we can't get through this clown's head? Everybody's a shopper. Do you ever hear your wife say, I'm going out buying you? Kill her. She says, I'm going out shopping. Now she comes back and she is carrying so much, it would rupture a man, but I guess they don't get ruptured. So she comes in the house with this. We are the most maligned group of people in America today, salespeople. Nobody, oh, what they call us. Why? They made the statement in Fortune magazine that we could have sold five billion dollars more worth of merchandise. In 1960, if we'd have had salespeople instead of clerks. Don't take my word for it. You know how many times you've gone in, you could strangle that guy in front of you. You have to buy or starve to death. Not so long ago, this bothered one of the watch companies, the Elgin Watch Company brought out a watch. They thought it was a tremendously good thing. Had a Dura mainspring. Couldn't wind it too tight. More people broke their watch at that time by overwinding them than for any other reason. So they sent these shoppers all around to see how their watch was going. And this one shopper walked into this one big store and this guy was real nice. He put the watches out. They don't talk much. They don't bother you. And so this fellow looked at the watches for quite a while and then he picked them up and he showed them to the clerk. And he asked him, he said, uh, what's the difference between those two watches that he's holding in his hand like this? And the clerk took him and looked at him like that, a very obliging fellow, and he turned around and he told him, it's $11.50. <laughs> Kill him. Kill him. He believes it. What's the difference between this car and this car here? He says right on the thing there, they make a paste it on there, now $289. What do you want, madam? He believes it. This man is destroying something that we need badly today. We have to have him. We can't do without him. The whole economy, we've told him this 80 million times, that the world, like Atlas, rests on him, but we can't get through, through, through his head, that we need him badly, that he must do this job for us. We give him advertising material to use, we tell him to use it. All kinds of advertising material. Where there's moving and stories, all right? The man's got the catalog. They want him to read the catalog and learn about how they pack the things and how they handle it. And then they give him one here from Motorola, and here's one from uh, Verdon Fans, Hinpointer Sales. Guy takes it home. All sorts of stuff. And What's this? A ballpoint pen. If I'd have known that, I'd have taken five of them. In the pocket. In the pocket with the pen. Uh-huh. Good. The nice thing about this guy is that he does take it home with him before he throws it away. You see, he would rather burn it at home than downtown. If he keeps this up, I wish him one thing. Leprosy in its advanced stages. You see, all we want him to do, it's quite simple. We know he can read. We proved it. Doesn't write too well, but he can read. All we want him to do is read this. All we wanted him to do was such a fundamentally easy thing. It is fantastic. Teach these people. Tell them about the product. There's a man in this room tonight from the Bell Electric. This guy almost stunned me. What he knew about this new tap and electric range, which I wanted to get, was fantastic. He's a throwback, much older man. You don't find too many of them now anymore. But it's like this sign that we have over here. All we're asking the fellow to do is tell a story. Just tell a story. See, up, oh, wrong one. <laughs> It's not that sign, it's this one over here. And you can't read this back there, so I'll read it to you. 
It says last year, over one million quarter inch drills were sold. Not because people wanted quarter inch drills, but because they wanted quarter inch holes. That's all we want him to do. Please, don't get technical with Let's not talk frequency response. Let's just show them that if they want to drill a hole, let's not tell them how the paint's made. What color do you want? We want them to transmit a message. We need this man. We need him badly. Because in this world today of ours, the change is so fantastic. You don't realize in our short lifetime how many things have come. New things, new things, all the time. New things are coming. We want him to go out and explain this. Because if he doesn't explain it to you, we're dead. He has a problem, of course, because there's two sides or three sides, I guess, to every side. His side, my side, and the right side. He goes out and he says to this man, look, I have this product, I want to sell it to you. And he explains it. When he gets all through, the dealer looks at him at the factory and says, yeah, that's very nice, but we don't get any calls for it. That's all. Don't get any calls for it, no. Well, that's the end of that. Oh, this bothered me all my life. I helped pioneer television. And I remember once talking to this guy like a Dutch uncle. I said, look, Lou, please put in one of these television sets. He didn't call them idiot boxes or TV. Uh, it's only the size of a retina. It's only a 10 inch. You move one refrigerator and put one in. He says, look, Kippo, you tell a good story, but we don't get any calls for television. What is it? I explained it again to him. He thought I was getting a little nuts, so he says, look, put one in and leave, will you? He's got them now. In fact, he's selling a lot of other products that he doesn't get any calls for. Stereo, hi-fi, and all these other things. If you want to sell tombstones, don't put them in your window. Guy will walk in, I guarantee the next day he'll say, Uncle Otto, go right over his face. Ticker, yeah. We need a stone. Believe me, it works what the eye sees, the eye buys. Don't you know that Woolworth, Kresge's, Grants, and all those people build an empire on exposure? You can hide it any place you want. Sure, they won't see it. You gotta tell them about it. That's all it's so simply there's no magic to it. That's why so many people are disappointed. They think they're gonna come to a sales rally and this bummer's gonna tell them something that's gonna change his life. He can't. You know how good business will be? As good as you wanna make it. That wanna make you throw up? <laughs> Put it right back on you. All you have to do are the little simple things. But tonight we must understand one thing. Why it happens. How we got like we are. If you don't understand that, if you don't accept about advertising and merchandising and the salesman and how he got to be what he is and why he must work harder, we're lost. Did you ever take the time that I have to study this and ask yourself, how do you become a salesman? How does a guy, how do you get to be a salesman? I asked this guy, well, Worthington, he says, um, <laughs> I used to play in an orchestra, to be honest with you, and they disbanded. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. And then what'd you do? Well, he says, I was out of work, and somebody says, why don't you be a salesman? <laughs> Seemed as good as anything else. I said, how long you been in it? 28 years. Mm -hmm. I figured. A salesman. How do you become a salesman? Why do you become a salesman? Look, uh, a doctor, a lawyer, a merchant. How many years does this man go to school to learn to be? To learn to be this, oh, you say, that isn't fair, Hippo. Well, how about bankers? Think of the time and money and the energy and the training that it takes to know all the things you must know about banking. Oh, don't count those things. Those are very high type, aristocratic type of things. Don't, don't pick those. Oh, you want me to pick something you look down your nose at? How about a plumber? How about a bricklayer? How about a lather? You want to take some of those on? How long do you think it takes to become a journeyman plumber and a master plumber? So long it would frighten you. And you better hope he learned his lesson when he comes to your house and you're standing up to your navel in water. <laughs> and he says, I missed it that night. I wasn't at school. <laughs> Swim. Oh, yeah. Everybody must train for what they do but us. 
We don't have to trade. He doesn't want to come to sales meetings. I could blow gun smoke. Please, don't ask me to go to a meeting. Don't you know Peter Gunn is on on Monday nights? <laughs> you must take the time to learn your perfection as well as somebody else. Remember, there's nothing else like it in the world. Nobody can make the money that we can make. But nobody. You want to be an engineer? We'll give you $22,500. Yeah? And I know this to be a fact. I know a nice little engineer that works for us. He has invented fabulous things. He has engineered his brains out. I make two and a half times what he does. There are two men here tonight with me that make more than he does. We can work as hard as we want. We can work night and day. We can do anything we want. He's dead. He's locked right in there. Nobody can make as much. He used to say about Schwab and about the steel mills, when he sold and the smoke came out of the chimney, then they had to make some steel because he could sell it faster than a horse could trot. Sales, sales. Learn this profession and learn it well. And remember, you can't do it in a back alley way. All of it is here. All this that they want to train you. You must take night after night. There aren't enough jobs for the relatives to fill. They gotta hire some of us. <laughs> now, I want to point this out to you. It is easy to stand up here and just malign somebody for hours. Of course, you, I don't have to explain this to you. I don't think there's anybody nutty enough in the room to think that I'm talking about anybody in the room obviously doesn't apply to us. But won't you tell some of the other people you see tomorrow about what we talked about tonight, about using the advertising and using the merchandising. And remember, how did you become a salesman? See, department stores, they're very high. They train their people exceptionally well. They bring them in and they tell them. They say, now, uh, can you write take? The guy says, yeah. He says, okay, if you can't write it, print it. You write cash? And so he goes through this, you know, and then they show him or her where the exits are and what time the coffee breaks are, and they're in for life. It's a terrific training. And they get just what they put into it. But like an AA, nobody can save an alcoholic. The AAs tell me, unless that person comes to them. You can never steer one of them in yourself. You can never take one. It's a complete waste of time. Until that alcoholic believes that he really needs help, you are wasting your time. I get mad sometimes when I talk to groups like this. And the guy says, why? I says, well, I don't think you're getting any place. They might laugh or think it's funny or something, but they just don't seem to really think, well, maybe the guy has a point. Maybe I'm weak on this one thing. I will do. Every time I get out of the car, I'll take a piece of that advertising material, and I will use it. I will use it. And if I just do that, I'll get better and better. And I'll learn to talk so that when people ask me, I will sound better. I want to tell you a story. I want you to remember it all the rest of your life. If you never remember another one, remember this one, it's true. About 10 years ago, and it's a true story, I was lying in my bed, in my twin bed, and my wife was in hers, and I was reading, and I mentioned to her, I said, Lorette, I noticed they're making the print smaller in the magazines and the books. She didn't even look up. She says, you need glasses. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For two bucks, you got a genius in the bed next to you. <laughs> I didn't pay any attention to her, and about a week later, I walked into a wall. <laughs> so I went to see this fellow, Dr. Rogers in Evanston, Illinois, and he brought me in. And what this man did to me, he examined me, he put me in a chair, and he... Had dials and things were going around. He put drops in my eyes. They had to lead me home. And oh, what he went through. And when he got all through an examination, he said, Mr. Hippel, uh, you need glasses. That'll be $35. Now, I didn't tell this bum. My wife told me the same thing for nothing with no equipment. <laughs> so I said to him, look, do I have to have them? Oh, no. He says, you don't have to have them. You could get a seeing eye dog. <laughs> Well, I says, if it's that bad, I'll come next week. He says, you do that. This is Monday. I'll have them made for you on Wednesday. So I, I went to see him. I don't know. I had a mental block about glasses. I have a twin brother. You see him on the television. as Elry Queen. He wore glasses when he was four years old. Four years old. We used to kick him in the belly, beat him on the head, and yell, four eyes. Oh, boy, glasses. This is the end. So I went back, though. I did have the courage to go back. 
And he met me, and for you people who don't wear glasses, I can't help you. So your day will come. You're just unlucky. That's all there's to it. And they have a little white table and everything, and they put the glasses down and rock them back and forth on that. And he put the glasses on me, and he said, uh, now, uh, how do those feel? I said, just fine. Boy, he said, you look like a million dollars in those glasses. Well, I said, thank you very much. He put the glasses back again. He put the tweezers. He rock them back and forth. He look them polish again now, he says, back and forth. How do they feel? I said, just fine. Well, there. He said, did you ever think of modeling glasses, the young executive type? I said, no, I hadn't. He said, Mrs. Bronson, come in here. I want you to see Mr. Hip. I bought two pair of glasses. <laughs> the last thing should happen to me is I get trapped without a pair of glasses. He's polishing them up. He's going to put them in a hand bone leather case. I said, I'll wear them. So I floated through the transom. I was standing outside on Evanston Boulevard there watching the peasants with the 2020 eyesight that couldn't wear glasses. <laughs> so I ran home. I said, Lorette, where are you? She says, I'm here. What happened? I says, I got the glasses. She says, you look like a million dollars. I said, that's what he said. I almost killed myself the first night. Did you ever try sleeping with glasses on? <laughs> This is the most contagious disease in the world. This guy had me thinking I was lucky because I was going blind. <laughs> Enthusiasm, there's nothing like it. The more you put out, the more you get back. Look, I don't want you to be laughing, boy, or anything like that and jump up and down on the counters. I just want you to double your enthusiasm about what you're doing. And I want you to remember what a man said. What a man said, and he built an empire on it. Yes, he built Sansinium. He's the man that said, if you want the public, to get excited about your product, first, get excited about it yourself. Remember what I'm telling you. If you want the public to get excited about your product, first, get excited about it yourself. So now I leave you with that one wonderful thought. I'm right. You can sell yourself rich. It's entirely up to you. Good night and thank you.